Okay, we've got an amazing quorum, critical crowd here. This is great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I am, and don't mind me as I <laughs> multitask letting people in. Um, I'm Dr. Amy Morgenstern. I am founder and CEO of Blue Stars Admissions Consulting. We work on college planning and admissions consulting, and it's where personal growth leads the way. And thank you so much for joining us on a Sunday. And I do want to say that time management is one of my absolute favorite topics. And I'm seriously not kidding. I could talk about it for a long time. And lucky for us, we have an expert in the field of time management to guide us through using the summer to practice it and getting ready for the next academic year and for life as well. So I would love to introduce to you Beth Samuelson, who has been running one of the most established consultancies in the Bay Area. She is an expert in executive function. She is the founder and director of SOS for Students. And I am just so excited to be talking with someone who's been in practice doing this for over 25 years. So doing this before, it really became something with a lot more attention, thank goodness. So I wanted to welcome you, Beth. Thank you so much. I'm I'm so excited to be here. It's fun to, now that school's out, to be able to focus on some topics that are very important to parents and, and students. And yet during the school year, we don't have the ability to literally take the time to focus on time because there's just too much going on. And now that we can take away, you know, homework and take away, um, you know, after school soccer and rehearsals and all of the demands, we can actually look at how can I tweak my time management over the summer and get ready for August. Crazy <laughs> as it is going back to school in August now that we do. So you've got, uh, you know, a couple months here to work on this. So we're here to talk to you about how to do that with, with some quick tips. This is going to go by, you know, pretty fast. So have your notes handy and uh, your pen and paper, you know, because taking notes is a, a strategy near and dear to my heart as an executive functioning expert. You won't remember what you heard unless you record it. Um, well, we are recording this, but you also should record it for yourself in your own words. So we are recording and we will be providing everyone with the recording sometime this week. I do want to note too that I know that there are some students of mine, at least, who are attending, and hi, guys, and right on. Love you guys for being so proactive. We have made this webinar it's a bit more pitched to parents, but for the students who are, who are here, you're amazing, and you are going to be amazing parents, too. So hopefully, I think this will be extremely helpful for you as well. So I think I'm going to share my screen so we can just get started on these Excellent. tips. Okay. There's something for everybody here tonight. In the meantime, right. I wanted to just talk briefly about why this topic is something that we get excited about focusing on for families. It's something that people ask about all the time. It's a big concern, starting with kids in middle school and going all the way through college. My university students at SOS are always dealing with time management challenges, and uh, it's obviously for families of younger students where parents are very involved still in day-to-day um, -day management of the students, whether the students like it or not, there's a lot of time uh, time management questions that come up with parents. And I'm going to tell you a quick story of, uh, of mine that really brings this home. And it's a cautionary tale so that hopefully when you hear this, you'll understand why we're having a webinar on time management for you and how to work on it over the summer. Um, probably about six, seven years ago now, I had a phone call from a, a mother um, on the East Coast. And um, some of my families who might know me have heard this story. If you're on the call and you've heard me tell you this, you'll re remember this, my favorite cautionary tale. Um, the mom called up and said, um, I've got a student at UC Berkeley. Uh, this is a, he's 20, he has ADHD, and um, he's really struggling to get to class on time. He is just not um, not making it. And so, so Beth, I got to ask you, I'm 
I'm uh, calling him in the morning in the fraternity house and waking him up to go to class. Uh, and I'm thinking I probably at some point have to stop doing that. What do you what do you think? Um, and of course, I was silent for a moment, taking this in on the other end. And I had a sense of of, of great concern for the family, especially for the young man who I'm sure wasn't thrilled getting calls from his mother in his fraternity house in the morning to send him to class. And I just had this vision of her calling up going, Mike, it's nine. Don't you have a class in an hour? What are you doing? I know I couldn't even, I couldn't even. Die. So I said to her, look, I said, I'm going to tell you right now, you've got to stop immediately phoning him to get him to class. He's 20. He has to get himself to class. And there was a deep sigh on the other end. And she said, I knew you were going to tell me that. And I know that's right, but this is really hard because I've always done this for him. And I, you know, I did it all through middle school, high school, and I haven't let go. And he wants me to stop, but I'm worried that he's not going to be okay. So, so this is, that story really struck me. Um, here we were with a third year Berkeley student who got into Cal certainly because of, not because of his time management skills, but because of his um, other, many other abilities. But here was his mother still trying to extricate herself uh, from managing his, his life and helping him with his executive functioning. So we don't want you to be that parent. We want you to build autonomy in your students, um, your kids, your teens, um, starting now with all kinds of strategies, but today our focus is time management. How do we get our kids to become more independent in handling, planning, and prioritizing and pull ourselves out of this job. So we've got the tips here tonight so you don't become Sherry in the East Coast calling her son in Berkeley. All right, there we go. That's my cautionary tale. Okay, cool. So okay. let's now let's get on this journey and find All out right, how not, not to be that parent. No, right? Not to be that parent. That's of it. That, right? Let's get them going right. way before they get to college. So quick agenda. This is our, you know, we're going to talk for about until 6.30, then we'll take questions and let's get going that, with that first tip. All right. Okay. Um, a little background quick for before we jump into time management. Oh, sorry. Um, focusing on it. That's okay. With um, executive functioning, um, time management is a, a component of the executive brain. And I want to just quick do a, a, a little bit of an overview of the executive brain for my families here. I'm assuming most of you are parents of students in middle school and high school, and, and the students probably on this call are mainly high school students, I would imagine maybe some college students. But the executive brain is responsible for things like planning, prioritizing, um, organization, working memory, um, and time management is a piece of that. So your brain is not fully, that part of your brain is not fully developed till you're about 26 years old. And that is a a hard pill to swallow for many parents, realizing that they are not going to see this fully fledged brain, this fully fledged prefrontal cortex for a few years yet. Um, but no, you can't wait till they're 26 to pull out of doing these things that we're going to be talking about. You have to start now. Um, and executive functioning is improved with strategies and, and opportunities to practice and having good modeling. So time management is no different than all the other components that we talk about at SOS. Um, it requires modeling, it requires practice, and, um, and in order to become independent, you have to have some good tools. So it's, a, it's harder for kids with ADHD and learning disabilities. These skills are often even more delayed um, in coming into uh, fruition. And we, we know um, that time management is a struggle anyway for for many of us regardless. And so um, let's jump right in. Yeah, I like that. Model, practice, and tools. Those Model, three, practice, and tools. Model, right. practice, those three key things. All right, let's yeah. get the first tip going. Okay, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. Perfect. All right. So here we are in the summer and it's a big uh, relief for everybody. No 7 a.m. wake ups, hopefully. I don't know, some of them have, I guess some of your kids might have jobs or camp. Um, but uh, still, at least the the uh, wear the wear and tear of the uh, school day is 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 released a little bit for for now. Um, so the responsibility for things like getting up in the morning, 
um, knowing where they have to be, whether it's for a counseling job or a camp or um, a doctor's appointment, these things need to shift over to adolescents pretty quickly. Um, we are, you don't, and this, this is really this important tip here, don't do for kids what they can do for themselves. When you're trying to do autonomy supportive parenting, you're boosting kids skills to be independent in these life hygiene, life management strategies. Waking up is a big one. You know, there you've got my, my mother on the East Coast waking up her 20 year old as a perfect example. I see this all the time, families coming in my office telling me that they're still, you know, getting their kids out of bed to go to school in the morning and they're frustrated and they're tired and they don't want to be the human alarm clock anymore. And um, they are telling their kids, I've had some students say, you know, I didn't know I was even meeting with you, Beth, for the first time until today at three o'clock. Mom said, we're going to an appointment. You're going to meet this executive function coach. I'm like, wait, nobody told you that you were coming in to see me? Nope. Uh, you know, parents are shaking her head. No, I did tell you, I talked to you about it a week ago. Was not on their calendar, not on their radar. So a lot of time management cueing happens from parents telling kids where to be and, and reminding them verbally. And this is something we're going to, that's going to be a theme throughout this, this short presentation is pulling out of doing verbal reminders and cueing and starting to minimize directions that you give your kids and set expectations for where they have to be and when and what you assume they are taking charge of. Okay. So yes, you should start waking start moving over the job of waking yourself up to kids over the summer. You can set an, a, a time frame. You really should be up by you know, if you don't have an early morning responsibility, you should be up by nine. Um, I expect that. And um, I'm not going to come and get you and appointments. Um, so we're going to talk about how you get appointments and doctor things and all of that to your kids. If you've got meds, the, you know, students need to take ADHD medication, for example, that can be sitting in a little container next to the bed with a glass of water set there by the student in, you know, for use in the morning. So these are, you know, plenty. Let's say the student um, struggles in the morning, not a, not a morning person. I can relate to that. Amy and I've talked about that. We're both night people and I never was, and I'm not now I'm better off. If I figure out what I'm going to wear the night before I lay it out and it cuts down on the morning decision-making that I don't have the bandwidth to deal with, you know, at time management in the morning is a struggle for kids during the year. So <clears throat> let's get that squared away. Don't give kids a lot of decision-making in the morning it slows everything down, all right? So that's critical. All right, so we're moving, it, the, the piece here is move things over to students, pull out of doing a lot of the prompting on this, these kinds of really basic things um, and get things on kids' calendars and let can re reduce decision-making in the morning to make time more efficient. All right. So what I'm hearing too is to help your children find and create systems rather than be the system. Yes, that's a great way of putting it. Yeah, I love that. <laughs> it's creating systems that don't involve you as the parent is critical because you're not going to college with these students. You cannot be Sherry in Westchester County calling Berkeley. You are not going to be that parent. Promise yourself tonight you're not going to do that. So the, a system is critical and students need to build systems to boost executive functioning. So you need a system to organize your backpack, a system to organize your docs on your computer, a system to take notes, and you need a system to manage your time. And that's why we're here tonight. Ready for the next tip? I am. Okay. I bet you're sitting there wondering, well, Beth, okay, how do I get these my teenager to uh, know that he's got a... a doctor's appointment, he's got an orthodontist, or he's going to go see me with his executive functioning coach, or he's got his college counselor that he's got to get an essay done for. How do I do this? Well, you don't yell up the stairs and make a, a verbal list. Let's take that out of the mix altogether. So those of you who tend to give directions on what to do and about where you're supposed to be and when orally, I want you to make a promise right now you're going to stop doing that. 
Okay, no, no more stopping tonight, firing myself from that job. Instead, I'm going to go over to this new system, which is to plan together collaboratively each week. Now, sometimes some people meet twice a week. You only really need to meet um, mandatory once a week. Everybody gets their calendars out. This is the modeling piece, right? This is where I take my phone. I get my, you know, some, some of you I've met a lot of parents still using paper planners. That's fine. Whatever it is, you, everybody shows up at the table preemptively, not, oh my God, we forgot something, but preemptively, we're going to sit here and plan for the week. What have we got going on? What are events the whole family is going to? We've got a wedding next weekend. Um, these are, you know, my son has got to be at a job interview. Okay. We've got sports events coming up. Oh, he's flying down to San Diego for a game. I bet, boy, I better get that. Let me get you the airline information that I booked for you. Let's get that on the calendar. So all these sorts of things that as parents, we've gotten used to handling for many years on our own and just sort of verbally reminding our family that we have to be places. Um, now we're going to let everybody do this together. Now, how do you do this? You sit down and everybody shares what they know they've got coming. Okay. And that means that if I know that I booked an appointment for my daughter, for example, for her um, dentist, that I send her a Google invite that she accepts that it's on her calendar and she creates a notification. You'd be shocked how many of my teenagers in my practice with coaching really have not used this system very much. They don't know how to regularly, you know, accept invites. I parents complain the invites sit in the email. Well, tell your kids you've got to say say maybe, and if it's maybe, tell me why, and if it's a yes, get it in there so it's booked in the calendar. So there shouldn't be any ambiguity. Let's say I know I'm going to need poster, uh, a, a poster board for a project. Let's not be doing that at 11 o'clock at night. Let's make a plan for any supplies pickup. Let's get the supplies on the calendar. If I need a supply pickup, great. Okay, no 911 last minute rescue. Okay, I'd like your help with the test prep this week. I've got a, a exam coming up. I'm wondering if you've got any time, dad, to help me out with the prep for that. Make sure you give parents enough notice. Everybody needs to have be front loaded, we call it in the executive function world. We front load people on what's coming so they're not blindsided by 3 p.m. meetings driving to me going, who is Beth Samuelson and why am I going to her office? So, um, so it, advanced notice is key here, all right? And that last bit there, empo you empower your students by giving planning and scheduling skills to them in this way. Um, they can come in and plan with you. And they've also, they might have their own events coming up. My daughter, for example, has been coordinating community service for her high school. And I've pretty much left that to her, but, you know, we have to drive her still. She doesn't drive. So I can't have her just announcing to me or my husband at the last minute that we have to drive her someplace. We both work. And if we don't know about it in advance, we can't do it. So mm -hmm. Um, I've made it very clear that she has to send us a, a notification on the calendar that she needs to be driven to her job at the, her community service piece. And so we we are abundantly clear we're involved here. So, I just want to say, yeah, I love the Google Calendar piece, the second yeah. bullet point to get parents into the habit of doing that because that as soon as a student signs on with us, we teach them Google Calendar. And even if they don't get it immediately, yes. over years, I mean, these are young minds. They weren't suited for this. <laughs> the Google Calendar was not made for the teen. Um, so we get them used to it. But if parents were collaborating as well, then, you know, that's that sort of, you know, the, the multilateral, the multifrontal approach. So I love that. Should yeah, we I think having a consistent approach, Amy, but that everybody's using in the house. Mm -hmm. It's tough when one person is using Outlook, somebody else is using a paper planner, somebody else is using a whiteboard. You know, it's just, it, it, and every we need to address people's preferences, obviously. Everybody's got a, a, you know, and it's fine. If you still like a paper planner, you like having a whiteboard, but everybody, the digital piece, everybody can use and it's very helpful. So it's a life skill. It's a life skill at this point. Let's move on. Let's move on because we've got more tips and we have some questions. Yeah. So, all right, let's get to tip number three. Okay. 
How do you get kids to plan effectively together and eventually pull yourself out of the job of doing the planning for them? Well, you start by demonstrating planning. You start by demonstrating how to use, and I've literally done this with my younger students, uh, particularly, and even with some high school students that don't use Google Calendar. I model how to use the task bar on the right-hand side, um, how to add events, how to create notifications, how to make sure you've got, if you need it, two notifications. Like I need a, you know, I need a, a one day warning and I need a 10 minute or a 15 minute warning. That all has to get put on there. Anytime you are introducing a new skill, modeling is key. It doesn't matter whether it's using a, using a planning system, using the dishwasher, all of that is, let me show you how to do it. And then, then we're gonna move over to doing it together. So model first, step two is collaborating, planning together. Um, so that's when you are doing some of your cueing, you know, your prompting. Hey, you know, don't, uh, don't you have a, uh, you, you, let's see, don't you have an interview for a volunteer job on Thursday? And I think you said you needed me to drive you over to a friend's house. I remember you telling me that, there's my prompt, okay? So students say, oh, that's right. All right, can you get that on the calendar right now and send that to me so that we've both got that? All right, <laughs> so I'm sitting there queuing that. That's how you have to start out. That's where your job as a parent with a teenager is shifting to more of a mentor and a facilitator, right? You're not doing for them. You're showing them how to do for themselves. All right, so there's the planning together. And then step three is, I'm going to let you, let you, do you, do you know how to use Google Calendar now? Do you feel like you could set up, um, you know, this, uh, you've got some plans to, we've got a, here's some uh, airline reservations that we've got for a trip we're doing down to LA. I'm going to show this to you. Can you um, add these into your calendar right now? Great. Okay. Let me see how you do it. Let me, I'll sit right next to you. Show me. So just so I know that you know how to get all that in. Okay. And then send an invite to your brother so that he's got that. All right, then I'm going to move out of that even. And then eventually the student is planning independently. This is a great time when students can eventually start contacting important people themselves. You know, this could even be like, I need to contact a teacher to have a meeting about my final when I get back in August. My final didn't go as well as I wanted it to in my bio class. So I think I'm going to go and meet with the teacher when I get back. Maybe I'll send an email, but I need to like make myself a plan to do that. So what you want is your student knowing what types of things need to go in the calendar. You know, this is one of them and, and going ahead and doing it without your prompting is your goal. I love just step one about prioritizing. And I think that learning how to prioritize is its own right. life skill. Because we're bombarded with so many things and there's so many things we can do. And I know we, we're we going to get back to that later. I just wanted, I wanted to, to note that it's such an, an important. How to prioritize is really important. How do you determine when something is more important than something else? Because sometimes you can get so overwhelmed that you think everything is of equal importance and it never is. So. <laughs> and I also want to note that we did have a student who wrote one of his supplemental essays on planning family trips. So I think it's so cool. We're going to talk about that. Actually, that's a super cool okay. idea for that's a summer tip. So we're talking about summer. This is the opportunity for you guys to do this with regards to your summer plans. You can even do this for, you know, the next coming, the coming, you know, months here, what's coming up for all of you, um, lay it out and you can put that new meeting into place weekly. Um, even during the summer, I would be doing planning meetings over the summer. Great. Shall we move on to, to yeah. put the whole, start putting the whole picture together here. Okay. All right. So this is tip number. This is when you're using um, a different, a, a, some an array of tools here and cueing the use of tools. So students need to find tools that are going to work for them. We all here, I think, agree that there is a piece that is digital because everybody can share that and uh, the family can all see it. So it is really important. And even before for example, not all middle school students have phones, but they've all got laptops. This can all be done through the calendar on that, you know, on their um, laptop. 
Um, there is a variety of ways to do this. I'm a huge fan of whiteboards and getting stuff up there, um, a to-do list, and then um, you, you know it's we, and moving away from parents giving those verbal directives. No, and don't forget, you know, you've got to clean the dishes. And you said you would do the five chores that we talked about, and then. Did you like get started on your driver's ed training that goes on your list too. And then just, we tend to just over before, you know, if the kid's standing there and said, I don't remember anything that you've said to me, except the last thing I have no memory of this. So, you know, we have to shrink the amount of verbal information we are giving students move to visuals, you know, visual planner, anything that planners that provide visual cues are better than verbal cues much better. Okay. Keep your verbal directive short and minimal. Um, there are some cool apps out there, by the way. Um, Common Sense Media has a great um, section for parents and students um, divided by grade level on different types of time management and task list um, apps. So I highly recommend having a look at that. Um, from really cute little things with animals and plants for elementary school kids, with you, should, you could be starting this with fourth and fifth graders, um, to um, more sophisticated tools like Todoist, T-O-D-O-I-S-T, for high school students. So highly recommend, you know, experiment, students need to experiment with what works for them. And, uh, and as I say, you're starting to pull yourself out of this. That's the goal here. These are some very cool tips. And again, it's great. It's the beginning of the summer because you can try and it's the trying things. Yes. Trying is good. Okay. Let's see what they can try uh, for tip number five. All right. Estimating time is great. Like how long do I think things are going to take? This is what you, another thing you can start doing this summer. Um, here's your nighttime routine. How long do you think your nighttime routine takes? How long do you think your morning routine takes? Let's make it as let's, and you're doing it in a way that is collaborative because it's helping students with time awareness. Time is a very abstract thing. Anyway, many students don't wear watches, they carry phones. So they're still waiting for somebody to tell them where to be um, if they don't have their phone to look at. So making it more concrete is critical by asking students to <clears throat> make up to think where they how much time these things take for them to do a shower getting my clothes out making a a plan for lunch the next day getting my homework done in each class how long do i think that's going to take on a given evening you know maybe look back over the past year since school's out now um are what tended to take longer than others what types of tasks knowing yourself you know getting stars for some students it's writing papers and they postpone them, they procrastinate because getting started, which is an executive functioning skill, is harder for them. So if getting started is hard for you on certain tasks, give, students need to give themselves more lead time. And that, and estimating how much time they need maybe to get going on that essay, you know, with its, you know, preliminary steps, brainstorming and outlining and so forth, is key to having a better grip on what they're going to need during a limited day post school to get things done, practice during the summer, um, shortening time frames like we talked about not doing clothes, um, you know, in the morning, choosing clothes the night before. Um, I had a student who we worked on um, choosing the plan, the the uh, breakfast and the lunch um, uh, ingredients from the beginning of the week. On Sunday, um, she would just sit down after we we modeled it in our sessions, and then on Sunday she would make a plan for what she wanted for lunch each day, check the refrigerator for what ingredients were in there and estimate how long it would take her to make her lunch um, or her and or her breakfast in the morning. Um, I also have students share, um, sh and parents share shopping lists with students. So that shortens time too, like grocery lists, have that for everybody to access. So estimating time, critical, predict how long things are gonna take you to do. For us, this is a key piece of personal growth. So when we, you know, when students, as soon as they sign on with us, whether they're ninth, 10th, 11th, one of the key things we do is let's share the screen. Let's look at the Google calendar, introduce us to your day. Talk to us about 
your routines, what's the time between you get up and when school starts, et cetera. And we go, we're very nosy, but that's how we can start to instill that, that consciousness, that time, that the quantitative time awareness, which again is an essential life skill. I like what you said about consciousness and awareness. Like that's really what this is. It's building awareness of these things. When you are a passenger in the car of your life and your parents are doing all this heavy lifting for you, you don't pay attention to it. If I'm waiting for my parent, my mom to tell me when I'm supposed to leave for school, I'm not paying attention to what time it is. So if you're frustrated with your kids for not moving on this and not paying attention to time, I really suggest you reflect on, is there any way that you can change what you're doing, parents, to facilitate the growth in this area? Can I pull back? Can I stop giving prompts? Can I not be the person telling them, we have to go, we have to go? Yes. So where can I stop? Fire yourself from that job sooner rather than later, because it won't get easier for students to do this the longer you stay involved. And I do want to say, and I, first of all, I do want to note we have two bonus tips we're going to get to very quickly and then get to questions, but I do want to add on to that too. So if things don't turn out the way a parent has imagined by the end of the summer, the summer after it might all come together. So it might take longer than you think, or you imagine you want, or you wish, because you're tired um, and you want to change the dynamic with your child. But, you know, we've worked with students who they were super sluggish at the beginning. And I had one student in mind, she just lost it over COVID and just scoffed at us. And she was also very creative. But when a push hit in 11th grade, all the stuff, you know, we, we keep telling her and reminding and practicing, not in a nagging way, just this could help. When a push came, it just everything kicked into gear and she got into some amazing colleges. I mean, she's just so even if it doesn't feel like it's working immediately, trust yes. the process. Yes. And parents are sometimes surprised, like when they pull back and say, it's on you. You know, you have to get your sub, the students step up, raise the bar and allow students to make missteps because they will, they're not going to, their yeah. executive brains are not the executive brains of a 50 year old. They are not. And so, or even a 30 year old. So there are, there are going to be, you know, just bumps along the way and that is okay. So instead of getting upset about it and saying, why didn't you manage your time better? Okay. Real quick tip added tip, don't ask why questions because they sound like accusations. So you want to get away from why didn't you manage your time better? So, so it looks like you um, were frustrated because you were late today. Can Do you want any help thinking through how to do this differently? You know, or do you have any ideas for how you could manage their time in the morning differently? Involve your students in making the changes and being the, the solution makers not you don't have to provide all the solutions either that's autonomy building as well and that might mean you have to take a little pause yes a pause before the why did you or why did it i take a breath yes it's hard. Right. okay let's move on a few more and then we'll yeah, take a couple questions. more and then we got questions okay bonus tip okay so this is a big one knowing i want to preface this by saying students it's a good idea to know for you students who are listening and parents know this yourselves anyway, as going through life, there are certain times a day when some activities are easier for you to do than others. Um, I, for example, prefer reading in the morning. I'm not great reading at night. I tend to fall asleep when I'm reading at night. Um, so anything that requires a lot of my attention um, or I have to take notes on it, I'm better off doing that early in the day. Writing papers, I tend to be able to do a bit later in the day. It's more active for me. Um, so student helping students teenagers understand what their best times of day are for doing certain kinds of tasks and also when students are stressed so guess where your emotional brain is in relationship to your executive brain right next to it the limbic brain which i had a colleague once upon a time called the limbic cesspool that's a great phrase is which is where you just go when you're you know anxious about a test or you're unhappy about uh, uh, something that happened with a friend that day. And those can affect your ability to activate on tasks, to organize, to get started, to manage your time. And it's hard when your parents come in and they're feeling like you're in that, you're feeling like you're in that mode, students, and your parents come in and say, 
Well, no, I, I, let's just, let me, let me sit down with you. I'll, I'll help you plan. Let's, let's get a, let's get a plan for this paper going. I, that'll help you feel better. You know, in that moment, that's probably not the best thing to be doing. So the good thing is to know when can you take a break and reflect and then come back and put your executive brain back in action. If your limbic brain is kind of flooding you, take time out and that's okay. Take a walk, get the dog out, go do another activity, text a friend, you know, go play the piano, paint a picture, do something different, but know when the time is right to help with and to provide support and when it's not. From our perspective with the longer term decisions, like, you know, what do you think your career is going to be? What do you think your major is going to be? You know, a teen is not not going to be able to make those decisions when they're stressed or under pressure or feel like they have to make that decision. But right. when they're exploring and they have some time, you know. Yeah, so being sensitive to your kids' best times to have those conversations is really important. And recognize that just because you're in the mood doesn't mean they are in the mood or they can take it take it in at that moment. So yeah. step away and don't be don't have your feelings hurt about it. Just say, you know what? It's not working for him right now. My son just needs a break and I'm going to walk away and we'll talk about this later. Okay. All right. Our last bonus tip. All right. All right. So training kids to figure out how to prioritize comes from starting out with making lists of to-dos and grouping the to-dos into um, what's coming. First of all, what's in proximity what is the high, highest weight, you know, point wise credits, you know, for grades, um, something that's coming due, or is it something that I can put off? What can I postpone doing? I like to use the model of, do I delete it? Can I delegate it? Do I defer it? Or do I deconstruct the task and make it more manageable? Those are all things to think about. So yeah. you can't fit everything into a day. Again, a visual is really helpful. In our workshops, we have the students take a calendar and actually block out a typical week. So talking about it while we're making the calendar and you, the, the students can see how much time is actually remaining in the day to get work done. Here's my little block. Oh, and I've got a free period there. Okay, how can I use that block? What's a priority for me? I'm most awake in the morning. Okay, I need to go see the teacher about help and I need to get started on my paper early in the day. So knowing what works for you and what you can postpone and teaching the, again, this is something you can model, you can practice together, and then you have students practice it with your feedback. And then you students can start eventually internalize these and you want these to become automated. As these skills become automated, it's less cognitive load. Students aren't having to remember these and ask for help or get reminders from you to do these. They just know it. And automaticity is where we're all trying to get with our students. So that I just do this without asking mom or dad for it. So we're back to providing the modeling, yep. providing the practice and the providing tools. the tools, right? So this is a great way to just open up questions. These, Thank you so very much for this information rich uh, the thoughtful presentation. While we're gathering questions, I'm just going to move on. And um, I know that you are offering summer workshops. So yeah. I'll sift through the chat while you want to talk about that for a second. Yeah, that's fine. This is just to let everybody know, um, executive functioning wise, we've got your back this summer. And if you want students, um, if you'd like to get some support on time management over the summer and planning and prioritizing, we've got some great opportunities for you to do it. We've got one-on-one -on -one summer coaching. Um, we've got an opportunity to get started on um, college applications and essays over the summer. And then we've got these fantastic workshops, you know, coming up, mastering middle school for kids entering sixth grade and um, all the way up through note-taking workshops for grades 10 through 12. You can see there's, a, and, and we've started a new workshop this year for students in grades four and five, because it is never too early to learn how to plan and prioritize and take notes. You should be learning that is, you know, starting nine, 10 years old, it makes it so much easier when you're 16. It's essential. It really yes. is like nutrition. I was thinking about that today as we were preparing. It's like, Food it's like the brain it really is Food for your prefrontal cortex. Yeah. I just That's want this it, very much. So I just want to introduce the audience also to our team, the amazing counselors who work with us and 
What we provide is admissions consulting for 12th graders, college planning, starting in ninth grade, building in those healthy habits, um, helping students, you know, define their passions, their interests, execute these passions. Uh, we also specialize in art admissions. We mostly work with STEM students, but we are specialists in art admissions as well. And we've got a summer sale going to encourage people to start early. So just wanted to make people aware of that. So with that, I'm going to stop the share and give you your first question All right. uh, that's coming up. So give me one moment here. And um, let's talk about the waking up kids in the morning. Right. <laughs> What happens if I keep trying and the kid doesn't wake up? What do I do? Um, so we, a lot of times the kids have gotten in the habit of their parents doing this for so long that they're really dependent on them. So there's a number of things that I have students do. So first of all, get a clock, um, have a regular alarm clock, set it away from the bed. Don't use the phone. Um, phone should be out of the room at night. It's better sleep hygiene. And you tell your, you sit your student down this summer in a very congenial meeting and you say, I'm moving the waking up over to you. If the time has come, you are you don't need me to do this anymore. It's a vote of confidence on your part that you can do this now. You know, mom and dad can pull out of this. So um, I there's an alarm, there's an alarm clock for everybody. Have the student choose the alarm clock, pick out something they're gonna like. Um, I've seen really silly ones, like there's one for students with ADHD that like literally jumps off the counter and runs around the room. Like that's- I see that. Know, right, and you have to get it. Like, there you go, and then it wakes you up. <laughs> um, I tell students to use the, um, keep the blinds partially open so that you are getting light in the morning and it wakes you up a bit earlier. So wake up slowly, give yourself the time, minimize your decisions that you have to make in the morning. But, you know, at some point, you know, you have to say, I'm done and I'm not doing this anymore because you are not going to be able to do this in four years. And if a student is old enough to get themselves to college, they certainly are old enough to get themselves out of bed and into class. And our high school and middle school students should be doing this as well. So we have a related question, which yep. is how do you overcome pushback from teenagers Um from the, like if if they don't want to do the modeling they don't want to get into a meeting how do how do you help them see the modeling is what the person I think it would start with you know prioritize yourself what do I really want the the family meeting I really would prioritize that I would say look we're doing this so that most students respond well to this which is I want to move myself out of nudging you and nagging you we used to have a t-shirt with our, SOS used to have a t-shirt that said, I got my parents off my back, ask me how. And that is like exactly what we want. I, we want you to feel like you can get off your kid's back. And the way to do that is to help students do this, do for themselves. So I would say simply the meeting is designed for us all to plan together as a team. You know, not for me to do stuff for you because you don't need that anymore. That's ridiculous. Why am I doing that for you? You are 15, 16, 14, 30. You don't need me to tell you where to go. You need to have this in your calendar. So see it as a positive and it's not punitive and that every and that you're moving kids to independence. And most students prefer to be independent and to have their parents letting go. And I guess having the patience for when they falter, you know. Yes. <laughs> and recognizing that it's it's, you know, it's gonna happen. You know, and the student will be sorry about it. And sometimes students just want to vent too. You don't need to fix everything. Oh, I'm sorry you were late. That must have been so frustrating. You can just validate, empathize, you know. You can't fix everything. Um, and admonishing a student who's already upset with themselves isn't really helpful either. So it's better to just validate and empathize, you know. There's a question about a watch. Does uh, some... Uh... One of our attendees' sons is asking for a watch. Does wearing a watch help with time management? Yes. Yes. I do think watches are great. They're very, you know, they're it's funny, funny. I've just, um, many students don't wear watches still. And uh, they, they, it is helpful because it makes time concrete. It's sitting and having that right there in your face is much easier. You don't have to pull a phone out. It's with you all the time, you know, and you can glance down at it. And that's, again, part of the problem. Time is so abstract for kids at this age um, who weren't brought up with clocks. 
there's another question here about Todoist. Yeah. And um, my son puts tasks in Todoist, but he doesn't remember to, to, to check it. How do I get him to check it on a regular basis? Oh, that's so, that's funny. Okay. So how do I get him to see where the question was? How do I get him to check it? So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> we got to move you out of, we want to get, how do you get him? How does he get himself to check it is the question you want to ask. So how he does that is by putting a notification on his calendar, check to doist, because it's not habit yet. To form a habit takes a number of repetitions, you know, and, and all the studies on forming habits. And there's people that that's all they do is look at how people develop habits. Fascinating, and, yeah. Right. And, and um, tiny habits, even like this, which is to look at a list mm -hmm. um, or, you know, I've had students that need to check Schoology or check Power School. I, they, I have them put it on their calendar with mm -hmm. a notification. Mm -hmm. And it's better if it's at the same time every day because repetition makes it easier to remember things. Yes, this is a core piece of my practice as well. And I learned it from Aristotle's, uh, Nick, he, I learned it from Aristotle's ethics because um, he understood that humans are creatures of habit and habituation in, in helping them become, you know, si you know, productive citizens of ancient Greece. That was a big piece. So it's so amazing, uh, like stuff that the, and he didn't have an Apple watch. He didn't need an Apple he watch. He did not have an Apple watch. No, he did not. And, and speaking of watches, we have a follow up question on the watch, okay. which is digital or analog watch. Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think. Um, there's there's good things for both i mean i i think that digital watches sometimes have um nice features on them like it depends on what kind of digital watch i mean if an apple watch a, a garmin something like that a fitbit um i think the kids do benefit from those they're nice for things like messaging um you know you can message on there you can there's a feature on an apple watch that is like a um, a walkie talkie where you can talk to somebody upstairs while you're downstairs so that's helpful so some of those digital watches are very useful in that respect and they count your steps and help you with exercise so um but you know some and some of our kids don't have not been in the habit of reading regular reading analog watches they don't um they don't know how to do it so i don't think it matters um i think a lot of the digital watch i wouldn't buy an expensive digital watch for a young student i don't think they need that i think you can get i think we got my daughter a, a, a low-end fitbit you know that's what she's been wearing mostly and I think it's it's okay. perfectly acceptable. Whatever I would ask a student, what do they prefer? You know, do they? And some of the digital watches you can make them into um, analog faces anyway if they like that and they think it's cool. But let the student choose. We have a question about what if they sleep through the the alarms and the snooze, and I'm thinking, let's get the alarm clock that jumps around. Maybe I don't yeah, know. Let's get other... the one you have to chase around the room. Yeah. Um, Any other advice for that? I think that students, yes, if they're not in the habit of getting themselves up, they need to set, they need to come, they need to be part of the solution. So this isn't working, I would say, this would be my conversation. You're sleeping, you're having difficulty sleeping through, and I'm pulling myself out of this because it's not my responsibility to get you up in the morning. It's up to you to get to school. So um, if the student's driving themselves, they're going to have to take the hit from being late and do detention. I mean, some of this is taking responsibility for, you know, your own choices that you made. Um, so, yeah, it's hard to get up in the morning, especially for teenagers who are not um, morning larks. You know, they they prefer to be up at night. That's how their body clock war is wired. It's also how you learn. You mess up. how you learn. I by, mess up. Right. I learn from messing yes. up. I hated being late. I, I was embarrassed walking into class late. So <laughs> that killed that as soon as, you know, when I was driving. The problem is when parents are still doing the driving and there's other kids involved, that can be frustrating. So you can say, look, you have to be ready to go by this time, or here are the alternatives for you to get to school. You know, I'm, I'm because I have to leave. I've got to take your two other siblings to school right. or you've got a carpool. A lot of times kids do better when there's a carpool because they feel a responsibility to the other right. families. One last question, because I know we're going over and I want to thank everybody for staying a little bit over. I'm just wondering if you have any advice to, oh, we just got another question in here though. Let's let, have, let this is an important one. So yeah, how, we got a couple of things in my chat. I'm seeing the chat here. There's two people. Yeah. Okay. How, how do, how do we um help, help kids remember to take care of their hygiene, like brushing your teeth and things like that? Okay. An important visual, yeah. That's a great question. Again, visual reminders are key. 
um, get away from the verbal directives um, and move things into um, hygiene lists. Like have the kids write a list of things that they have to do that are the hygiene pieces. Like I have to brush my teeth. I have to floss. That could be a little laminated list hanging in the bathroom. You know, it could be right next to the bathroom sink. And then the night before, where's your visual cues, right? Put your brush and your toothpaste and your whatever else, your ADHD meds, it doesn't matter. Just have that sitting on the sink. So I see it and then I will use, we are more likely to use stuff that we see. Okay. And then the list is, to, remember, there's the habit you're trying to form. Here's the routine. Kids work better with repeatable routines and habits. If it doesn't change, it creates structure. And we all know that structure is helpful for building automaticity. And again, it takes a minute for that habit to it kick takes a minute. in. And that's oh the, that's, it's hard for the parent. It's, that's, not, that's the hardest piece right there, you know? It's hard because you take it on yourself. You feel like it's your fault because I must have done something wrong because they're not doing it. It's not your fault. This is part of natural executive functioning development is learning to pull back from parent reminders and allowing students to build these skills themselves. Okay, so visuals, I was going to say another thing, like let's say you want the dishwasher done a certain way. Take a photograph of a perfectly loaded dishwasher and post it next to the dishwasher so they can remember what to do. It saves time. Then you're not talking at them. D you didn't do it this way. The cereal bowls go here. No, and then it slows the whole, it gums up the work, slows it down. Visual reminders are more efficient. And the other piece we had talked about earlier, we haven't talked about in the webinar yeah. is, um, you know, having another party, having a tutor, having a coach, maybe the communication isn't working. You've hit a wall with your child. Yep. Well, think, you know, you, you don't have to do it. The, you can get in touch with your village. You know what I mean? Think your about village that. is key. Not everybody is equally receptive to parental intervention. However, gently, um, kindly and well-meaning it is administered, offered, it, it, there's a layer of it. You know, I do this for, this is what I'm an executive functioning. I direct an executive functioning company and I do not do this kind of support with my own kid. She has a coach that she works with because it's just easier to download about test prep that didn't go well or um, planning that got jammed up with procrastination. If I come in and try and help with that, it just feels a little more like criticism, like judgment. And I try not to do it. I try to say it right because I do this for a living. I should know how to say this, but I don't always say the right things either to my own kid. So the mom, the mom who, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, no, you're fine. The mom who had a question about the son and his hygiene, like a, a, an older teen role model or, a, 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 you know, a male in his 20s who's looking sharp or whatever it is, who maybe has the look that the teen, you know what I mean? That, yeah. you know, thinking, not, not thinking that you, the parent has to be the solution for everything, but yeah, you like, don't have to be this. That's well, perfect. Look into your network. <laughs> yeah. Use your network model. Yeah. Things like, it, but there are basic things like toiletry, toilet have, you know, like showering and these kinds of things with, with kids, we really have to build a routine and, and just make us, this is the step we talk about an SOS a lot by step by step, you know, what are the steps to getting this routine done? You know, break the break the hygiene into deconstruct it into um, individual actions that you can take, and everything is easier when deconstructed into smaller units. Much easier. Chunk it out. Chunk it out. Chunk the darn thing out. That's right. <laughs> exactly. Chunk it out. And I think that could be our our parting words. <laughs> yes. Model, practice, tools, and chunk it. And, and wait, patience. we had and the last one. Don't forget, front load your kids. Let them know where they need to be when start planning helping um amy just to throw out what you said about planning trips last quick tip good summer thing to do um you're going to a destination you're going as a family doesn't matter where it is mendocino you know new york city bam i don't care where it is have your kids choose a day that they plan and break it up into how much time you know what are the activities you'd like to do where do you want to go What's a map of the route? How much time should we spend at each place? So that kids get an opportunity to think through something. It's novel, but it's interesting. And it allows them to also, they get invested in it because they're making the choice to um, create the day that they're, and, and the whole family gets to go along on that day. 
So that can be a really fun way for kids to learn how to manage time. Yeah, so for parents to think, what are the opportunities here? Just like we often think in business, but now in terms of what are the, you know, how, what are the opportunities to have my student, my, my, my student, my child step up? And, and where can I step back? Step up, yes. step back, right? Please feel free to um, contact, you know, either of us. Oh, I'm so glad we've got a little comment here. Just yeah. on the other trip, yeah. Um, You've got a fad. Of course you have a fad. You're amazing. Oh, thank you. You're so sweet. <laughs> oh my God. I really appreciate that. Um, somebody, there's an alarm clock that has an app on your phone so you can snooze or turn off your alarm. What is frustrating is sleeping through the alarm and snooze. Yes, it is incredibly frustrating. Yeah. So yeah. So leave light on in your room, the sunlight that helps a lot. It turns off just a quick note about sleep with teenagers. Um, the pineal gland, which releases melatonin, um, stops the release of melatonin later in teenagers than it does in adults. So, and it, and it starts it later so that that's why they want to go to bed later. Mm -hmm. So if you throw light into the room, bright light, it shuts off the flow of melatonin and gets them awake sooner. So that's a tip I, I give to my teenagers to leave a little chunk of sunlight coming in. Okay. It works. Thank, Thank you so much, everybody for Thank coming. You. Thank you. Thanks, Amy, for having me. This was so uh, fun. It's always great to converse over. With always converse appreciate this. Over time management. So yes. yes, we will be sending the recording to all the attendees. So if you want to check it out or share it with people, that'll be coming this week. And you can get in touch with us anytime. Thanks so much for attending and happy rest of the Sunday to happy, everyone. And happy rest of the summer and get in touch. Happy summer. Yeah, have fun, enjoy it, and do some Thanks, great everybody. Take care.